Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity to welcome to our college community uh, Joel White and his wife Tatiana. You may have noticed them around these last couple of days and uh, wondered what they were doing here. Uh, Joel is a professor of New Testament. Uh, I would tell you the name of his institution, but it's in German and I'm scared. Uh, <laughs> at FTH in, um, in Gießen, is that? Gießen, uh, in Germany. Uh, Joel and his wife are Americans, actually, originally, but uh, they've been serving as missionaries in Germany for many years now. Uh, and you'll be with us for a little while, I think. Is that right? Yeah. So, welcome to our community. It's wonderful to have you. Please do make them feel welcome, and please do get to know them. Okay. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the sleep last night and the blessing it is to wake up and live today. Thank you for the food and shelter and clothes you continually provide for us. Today we pray for our families. We thank you for all of those who have raised and cared for us since we were children. And thank you for the blessing it is to marry and create new families. We pray for the families of all of our students. Many, many of our students have had to leave their loved ones and travel far away from them. And this is a hard sacrifice that they are making for your kingdom. Please, would you care for their wives and husbands, children, parents, siblings, uncles and aunties, grandparents, and many cousins. Please provide for them and comfort them as they miss their loved ones who are here with us in Cape Town. We give you thanks for the gift of life, and we thank you that Stephine's wife, Charity, has given birth to their first spurt-born son only last week. We praise you for the safe delivery, and we pray that you might comfort Stephine as he waits many months before he might meet his little boy. We pray for those in our community who are far away when dear family members pass away. We continue to pray for our brother Isaac, whose father, uncle, and cousin have all left us recently. Comfort him and bring him peace. For all of us who have experienced grief and joys but are far from family and friends, please bring us comfort. And for all of those who are near to family and also experience grief and joy, help us never to remember the blessing of the family and friends you bring close to us. We thank you that you are our Father, that Jesus is our brother and that we are surrounded by our eternal brothers and sisters in this room. And we pray, that all the, or we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning. The righteous remnant still here. Lovely to see you, and I hope that... Through this next three days, when does language school end on Friday? That through these next three days, you will have lots of fun and enjoy what you're learning. It's a real privilege for me to be with you again this morning. So thank you for being here. Let me pray. Well, let me read first and then I'll pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 4 to verse 9. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 9. Paul writes, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless to the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, as we turn to the short paragraph of this important letter, I pray that you'll help me again this morning to be clear 
Um, help me to be persuasive in the true sense of that word, to take what Paul is arguing and to show how real and relevant it is for us today. May we be learning out of your word, but for our own world and for our own experience. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, if you do read through 1 Corinthians, as I hope you will do, I hope that our time together this week, short as it is and very superficial as it is, will prompt you and encourage you and inspire you to actually read 1 Corinthians for yourself. The good news is when you get to year two, you'll actually study it. But how far you'll actually get through the book, that is a mystery and will only be made known when you get there. I too have been a lecturer at Whitfield and know that the best intentions of lecturers to do this much often end with us just doing this much. However, 1 Corinthians is in your Bible for you to read. When you read through it, as I know you will do at some point, you will very quickly discover that Paul deals with a whole range of issues in this letter. There are a whole lot of things that he deals with. Some of those things were brought to his attention by the people who visited him. Some of those things arose in response or through a letter that they wrote to him. So there are a whole range of things. Issues about food offered to idols, issues about gospel and culture, issues about the gospel itself and what lies at the heart of the gospel, issues about marriage, remarriage, a whole host of things. I think, however, though, that among the many issues and questions that Paul deals with in this letter, none in my experience at least, yours might be different, but in my experience at least, none has captured the attention of contemporary readers of 1 Corinthians more than the issue of spiritual gifts. If I was to ask you to raise your hand around the issues that you think are most clearly talked about from 1 Corinthians, I'm sure that if I said spiritual gifts, all of you would, or most of you would raise your hand. The question of these gifts, what they are, what their role is, what their purpose is in the church today. In fact, so much so that in our time still, we have whole groups of Christians defining themselves precisely on the basis of the word that Paul uses to talk about spiritual gifts, the charismata. So we have in our circles, probably in yours too, people who talk about themselves as either charismatic or non-charismatic. Now, not the question of spiritual gifts was of importance to Paul and to the church in Corinth. I think we can see from two things. We can see it from the sustained treatment that Paul gives it in the famous chapters 12 through 14, where Paul actually focuses his attention on well, pneumatica, spiritualities, or spirituals, and charismata, spiritual gifts. And we won't dwell on that now, but it's very important to see the shift of language that Paul uses in chapter 12 and then on through 12, 13, and 14. So three chapters of sustained teaching, chapters in which some of Paul's strongest rhetoric is to be found. We spoke about that in terms of pride. Remember, love is not proud, implied you Corinthians are. Love is not arrogant, implied. You Corinthians are. So 12 to 14 is the famous part of 1 Corinthians when it comes to spiritual gifts. But I think the fact that this was important to Paul and to the Corinthians can also be seen by the fact that he raises the issue of giftedness in the very first chapter. Remember what we said at the beginning two days ago? That the first chapter of this letter introduces us to many of the key themes and highlights for us some of the key problems. So already in verse 4, in Paul's great thanksgiving, we find the, ho- the focus of his thanksgiving is not on their faith, love, and hope, which is typical of Paul in other letters, but on their giftedness. Can you see that? And so right at the beginning of this letter, Paul puts the issue of gifts and giftedness on the agenda, which tells us that this is a really important thing to Paul and to them, and therefore to us. And it also tells us that probably this issue of gifts had its own part to play in the problems that existed in Corinth, both the problems that they had within the community, 
But also, and don't forget this, the problem that they had with Paul. Yesterday was rather inadequate from my side because, well, for all sorts of reasons. But the thing I want you to take on board from yesterday is this, that one of the key problems in this church and the reason why Paul begins as he begins and introduces himself as he introduces himself is because it's not just that the Corinthians have issues among themselves. That is true, and there are divisions. The issue is that the Corinthians have problems with Paul. And that is very clear, as I said yesterday, by the fact that he highlights his own apostolic authority at a time when the church knew him well enough for him not to have had to say any of that. When you read the Bible, don't only ask what it's saying, but why it is saying what it's saying. You with me? Why is it saying this? Why does Paul go to the trouble of saying, called by God, an apostle of Christ? Well, rest of the New Testament, we find he only ever says that when people have a problem with him. Even if he doesn't know the church, if there's an issue with other leaders, other teachers, like in Ephesus, men coming and drawing away disciples after themselves, Paul wants to assert his authority. And in this battle between the Corinthians and Paul, the issue of gifts and giftedness plays its part. So then, what do we learn from these verses 4 to 9 of 1 Corinthians about the question of gifts? I think the first thing we learn in verse 4 is that Paul is genuinely thankful not just for the Corinthians, but for the gifts that God has given them. Can you see that? I give thanks to my God always because of the grace that he has given you, that in every way you are enriched. It's not just I give thanks to my God for the grace that is given to you because you're Christians. Paul is thankful for them as Christians. But the way in which verse 4 and verse 5 read is that part of the reason for Paul's thankfulness is their giftedness. You with me? I give thanks to God for all of you, for his grace shown you, that in every way you were enriched in him. Paul is thankful for their gifts. Thankful for what he saw among them, and thankful for the massive amount of giftedness that was real in that church. So whatever else verse 4 and verse 9 are designed to accomplish, can I say that they are certainly designed to affirm the reality of the gifts that the Corinthians enjoyed, to give genuine thanks to God for them. So we do not find Paul doubting the existence of these gifts. Yeah? Yeah? We don't find Paul arguing about whether there are such things or not. And we certainly, and this is very important for when you engage with people who may see things differently from you on this point, we certainly don't find Paul using the idea or the word charismatic as an insult or a pejorative term. Don't ever do that. Don't ever use that word in a negative, pejorative, judgmental, writing-off way of other people who have different views from you on this issue. Yeah? Paul never does that. That the Corinthians have got a wrong view of their gifts will become very clear, and 12 to 14 makes that absolutely clear. That the gifts aren't always used well, that's clear, and 12 to 14 make that clear. But Paul will not use these words other than in the context of gratitude to God. So there's the lesson for those of us who consider ourselves to look down our noses at charismatics. Don't do that. It's not a Christian attitude, actually, brothers and sisters. I speak from my own experience because when I was at Bible college, there were all sorts of books around called Charismatic Chaos and all of these kinds of things in which... The poor charismatics were hammered left, right, and center by those who knew better. Now, I have my own views on the gifts and their use. Don't, mis don't be mistaken. But I have to say that my attitude then as a theological student was dishonoring to Christ. 
It really was. And I was reminded of that I was preparing this week. That Paul will not use the word charismatic as a swear word. Secondly, what do we notice in these verses? Well, not only is Paul thankful for these gifts, not only does he actually speak very positively about these gifts, but he also, and I suppose the best way to describe this is to say that Paul underlines, as it were, in black ink through repetition of words, the fact that the gifts are precisely that. That they are gifts. Now, that might, you might say, well, Mervyn, thank you. I got up this morning. I really didn't feel like coming to chapel. Um, I've got all sorts of Greek and Hebrew to do, and here I am because I'm a good, decent, friendly person. I thought, I'll come and support you. I'm sitting on my chair in chapel, and what you tell me is that 1 Corinthians tells me that gifts are given. Thank you very much for that. I could have worked that out over coffee at Hanson Lloyd. Okay. Well, thank you for that. How do we know that Paul is emphasizing the givenness of the gifts? Well, I think we know it, first of all, because he gives thanks for them, right? The whole thing is cast within the context of thankfulness. And Paul is genuinely thankful, but why does he tell the Corinthians that he's thankful? Why doesn't he just say to God, I'm thanking you, God, for the gifts you gave them? Why does Paul tell them that he thanks God for the gifts that God has given them? I think thankfulness creates the context in which givenness is understood, right? Now, I don't know how you were raised or what context you were raised in. I'm sure in this room, many, many different contexts. But I'm sure that the influential person in your life, although most of you are too young to remember what letters are, and it wouldn't do you any good now either because they don't get delivered. I discovered, I was writing a letter to Dick Lucas the other day, and I discovered from David Monteith, who is our postman for this purpose, that he used to print out the letter and put it in the first-class post in London, and Dick would get it the same day. I now gather that first-class post, which is meant to be the same day in England, can take as long as two weeks to be delivered. So it isn't only the South African post office that's in a mess. By the way, well done, Bafana Bafana. What a great win that was. <laughs> yeah, boy. Sorry for you if you are from Morocco. Anybody from Morocco? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we win so, late, so seldom, we should crow when we do win, right? What in the world am I talking about? I have absolutely no idea. Oh, yes, never mind. So, the thankfulness that Paul has, this is the problem when you talk nonsense, you distract yourself in your own sermon. Don't do that. So, here is Paul thankful for this gift, but also it's the emphasis on the repetition here. Notice the grace, this gift of God, that was, verse 4, given, that in every way you were enriched, there's a passive, so that you are not, verse 7, lacking in any gift. Grace given gift. All of which stresses that whatever the Corinthians had, it was a gift, to state the obvious. It was a gift. Now I think, in fact I don't just think, I think I know, <laughs> that the reason that Paul in this first chapter is stressing the givenness of the gifts is because the Corinthians have forgotten that gifts are given. And they have begun to think of their gifts in another way. If you ever get time to do 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Paul's use of pneumatica versus charismata, 12.1 should be translated now concerning spirituality. Just turn to 12.1, will you? And even if you won't, just turn there. Isn't that a funny thing we often say? Let's pray. I often want to say, well, let's not. <laughs> Shall we turn there? No, let's not. So please turn to 1 Corinthians 12. Look at verse 1. Most translations, I think, have now concerning spiritual gifts, yeah? 
It's not the same word that Paul uses later on for spiritual gifts, charismata. It is now concerning spirituals or spiritual things or spiritual people, pneumatica. I want you to be un- not to be uninformed. When you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. We won't discuss that now. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That's the thing I want you to notice. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So Paul gives you in these opening verses of chapter 12 a definition of spirituality. The Christian is a spiritual person. So whatever else we think about these things, the one thing we cannot do is say, well, X, Y, and Z gifts mean you have the Holy Spirit. Q, R, and S gifts mean you don't yet have the Holy Spirit. Right? That would be a grave error. As bad as looking down our noses on the charismata. To see these things as a cause of boasting, as a sign of superiority. Oh, I have this gift. I've arrived. I'm superior to you. What a load of nonsense. Paul won't have that. He won't have giftedness confused with spirituality. Do you see the point? Giftedness is just giftedness. Spirituality comes from belonging to Christ. If you belong to Christ, say, Jesus is Lord Well, that is the sign that you have the Spirit. But from that one Spirit come many different gifts. And to use the gifts as if they were talents, to confuse giftedness with turning it into talents that we have, and therefore boasting about it, well, that is a massive, massive problem. So, on the one hand, Paul is thankful for the gifts and will not use the word charismata as an insult. On the other hand, Paul is thankful for the gifts and he will not allow the Corinthians to use the gifts as measures of spirituality or as indications of superiority. You with me? Yep. Still awake? Yeah. Number three. This one might take a little bit of convincing. So please engage brain and follow with me. The third thing that Paul teaches us in this first chapter, and it comes up again in chapter 12 through 14, is that the spiritual gifts are not a sign of having arrived. They are not a sign of having arrived. How do we know that? Well, here again, I think we need to understand something of Paul's use of irony and the way in which Paul contrasts ideas. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 5 to 7. What do you see there? I mean, lots of things, I suppose. But what I want you to notice is the universality, the emphasis that Paul puts on the holistic nature of their experience. Even as you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, verse 7, so that you are not lacking, right? All speech, underline. All knowledge, underline. Not lacking in anything. These Corinthians have got it all. And then, verse 7, as you wait for the revealing of Christ. You have it all, yes, But having it all does not mean that you've already arrived. Now, there are lots of other things going on in 1 Corinthians that point us in this direction. Their weird view of the resurrection. We are already raised with Christ, they say. 
It's not that they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection for Jesus. It's just that they thought that his resurrection meant their resurrection in the fullness of the kingdom, your best life, now I've arrived. No, you haven't. At the end of 1 Corinthians 13, those infamous verses in which people argue for or against cessationism, the ending of the gifts. The whole point of that chapter is that the perfect has not yet come, right? I Now I am like a child. I see you like a child. I think like a child. In other words, for all your gifts, you are still, what? A child. The perfect has not yet come. You do not know fully as you will be known. You still see in that murky mirror. Alison and I have got very strange decorating tastes, and we have all sorts of old things in our house from her grandmother and beyond. Some of the mirrors we have, we've got this extraordinary mirror that folds out of, it's quite a, you've got to see it to actually understand it. But when you fold it out and you look in the glass, it's smoky and you can hardly see anything. Needless to say, I use it more and more as a mirror now because it gives me the best possible view. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, when you look in it, you don't see clearly. Paul's point to them is, yes, you have all these gifts. Indeed, you may think that you already speak the language of heaven, the gift, the language of angels. But let me tell you something, Corinthians, you have not yet arrived. You are far from having arrived. In fact, you're not even grown up yet. The Corinthians thought that their gifts meant that the kingdom had come upon them in its fullness. Paul's point to them is your gifts mean that the kingdom has come upon you only in its first fruits. And you have to wait. You haven't yet arrived. In fact, the gifts are simply tools for the journey, not marks of having arrived. Now, you may not be persuaded of that. Well, that's fine. Go and do the work for yourself and see what you think. Number four. Probably the last thing I want to say, because you've all had a long week, and I'm sure you need a bit of time between now and your lecture. I think the most important of all the things comes in verse 9. Have a look at how Paul describes your Christian experience in verse 9, will you? He tells us that God is faithful, for which we're very grateful. God finishes what he starts. That's a great comfort, isn't it? I've been a Christian for, I don't know, more than 40 years now. 43 years or whatever it is. I'm so glad God finishes what he starts. Now, because along the way, I've messed up rather badly. And if it was all up to me, um, I would have fallen away long ago. But God finishes what he starts. God is faithful. He's faithful to his church, even his problematic church. He's faithful to his children, even his problem children. Was it in Claus? I can't remember one of those animated films where there's this island of misfit toys. I think that's true of Christians, right? We're all an island of misfit toys. Not fully remade, not 100% repaired, all on a journey towards perfection. How good it is to know that God is faithful. But I want you to notice how you are described. You are called into the fellowship of his son. Now, that certainly means that you are called into fellowship with his son. Remember what we saw at the end of yesterday? We dropped in some bonus material. Mind you, that you only find on DVDs, and most of you haven't got a clue what a DVD is. Nevertheless, remember 1 John, where John writes and says, we tell you this, what we have seen and heard, so that you might have fellowship with us and our fellowship with us to the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So that little throwaway line yesterday, that the way you and I have fellowship with God today is by having fellowship, well, let me go backwards, by having fellowship with the apostles and their writings. That's how we know God and meet him, right? Through his word, his written word. So, God who has called you into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. That does mean that as a Christian, you are called into fellowship with Christ. 
and I hope that that is your experience. Just because you're at theological college doesn't mean that you have to step away for three years from your devotional life, okay? Your exegesis classes are not going to do it for you. You actually need to read your Bible and say your prayers as a Christian. Before you are a theological student, you are a Christian. And you are called into fellowship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That is a massive privilege. Do you, I mean, I'm sure you know how, what a great privilege that is, right? For those of you who are raised in a Christian home, it's probably something you've always known. For me, becoming a Christian in my mid-twenties from a very wayward and rebellious life, that is an extraordinary thing that I, being who I am, Mike reminded us yesterday of the grace of God in this, that I, being who I am, can actually be in fellowship with Christ is an extraordinary thing. But the fellowship of Jesus Christ here is not just about you and Jesus. Paul's use of that language here and throughout his writing is to remind you that you and Jesus happens in the, con in the context of others and Jesus. When you are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, you're called into the church. The other day I had a burger and a beer, if I'm allowed to admit that, with a long-standing friend who's given up on church. He tells me, and I think he really is still a Christian, but he's given up on church because the church has let him down. I want to say to him, well, what did you expect? You were part of it. I'm part of it, so what did you expect? No, no, the church will absolutely let you down. Make no mistake about it. This college community is going to let you down. Perhaps it already has. But understand that when you are called to Christ, you are called into the fellowship of his people. Diane spoke about that in her prayer this morning. I wonder if you noticed. We didn't collude. I'm going to say this, Diane, please pray that. She prayed as she felt led, and in that prayer there was a very clear reference, not only to your family, some of whom are very far away, but to the fact that we are a family. So whatever gifts God has given you, he has given them to you, not for boasting, not for burying in the sand, but for using in blessing and serving the family. It is in the context of gifts that Paul speaks about us being called into the fellowship. And what Paul anticipates here in verse 9, he unpacks in 12, 13, and 14, where he keeps reminding the Corinthians that gifts are for building up. So no negative comments about, comments about charismatics, no boasting about your gifts, no thinking that you've arrived just because you're gifted. Thankfulness, not pride, is the response to gifts. And by the way, Paul just lists some of the gifts, but I think they're far wider than the list that Paul gives in Corinthians, right? And above all, whatever gifts God has given you, remember that he has given them for use among your brothers and sisters, for their good. Amen to that? Let me pray. Father, as we think about these important things and some of the division that has been caused in your church down the ages and worldwide, precisely over this issue, we pray that you will forgive us where we have made the question of gifts and spiritual gifts a cause of pride, a cause of arrogance, a cause of judgment, and where we've sat on our gifts rather like the man burying his talents in the sand, and where we have not used the gifts that you have given us for the building up and service of one another. Please forgive us for that. Thank you, Lord, for each Christian in this room and for every gift that you have given to them. And we pray that as they 
enjoy these gifts, we may share in the blessing of their use. Pray for today's teaching, for all who learn and for all who teach, that it may indeed be a day of fellowship. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have a couple more guests with us today for lunch. We will have Andre Vasaki from Christ Church Tigerberg, Andrew Barnes from St. Paul's in Lavender Hill, and Amanda Pungula from the Student Y at the University of Cape Town. Uh, so please find them at lunch, chat to them about their ministry opportunities. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone coming tomorrow, so I won't be up here to remind you tomorrow. So we'll have Brother Mervyn tomorrow, talking about St. James in Kenilworth. Okay, there we go. So, go in peace, love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.